the stars in the universe. Uh, I'm an observational astronomer. Uh, that means I just take pictures. Uh, and one of the places that I take these pictures is typically the National Observatory. Uh, this big telescope here is the four meter telescope. Uh, the Godwin Cluster Research does not require that much light depth and capacity. And I'm taking some data here on the two meter, but mostly it's telescopes of this size, uh, somewhere around a meter, that are best suited to the kind of research that I do. This uh, up in Tucson, Arizona, of course, is the northern hemisphere observatory for the United States. Uh, some of the uh, globular clusters that I study uh, are in the southern hemisphere, so you have to go south. This is a Cerro de Lola in Chile. And again, uh, this is the 9.9 meter telescope that I observe from. Uh, some of my colleagues are European, so as a result, I have access to the European Southern Observatory and also some of the data I've taken. Uh, there are about 150 globular clusters uh, surrounding our galaxy. Uh, I've, I've taken data on approximately 12. I have this little building for the first time actually changing without going over there. <laughs> uh, in the old days, uh, observers would have to observe from the room that contained the telescope. And of course, the opening was there, and the temperature of the inside had to be the same as the temperature of the outside, so mostly they almost froze to death. Uh, they probably think we're a bunch of wimps because we now observe from a nice temperature control of room. Uh, on the point nine meter, you normally don't have a technician. So on a normal run, I would scoot my chair back and forth. Uh, this particular computer controls the uh, instrument, uh, a CCD imaging camera. Uh, the uh, computer is used to pick the filter that you're going to view the galaxy or the uh, cluster through. It uh, picks the exposure time. Whereas this other, oops, <laughs> take me a while. This other computer over here uh, determines where the telescope points. So what I would do, uh, this is uh, some of you may know him. Uh, he's a local amateur astronomer, uh, Roger Harvey, and he uh, pleaded to go with me on one of my observatories. Fortunately for me and him, uh, they allowed him to do that. So he pointed the telescope uh, while I controlled the. Uh, the, uh, the type of stars that I study, variable stars, are called RR Lyrae stars. Uh, these are stars that have, they're in the process of dying. Uh, they've already depleted all the hydrogen in their core, which is what our sun is doing right now. But these stars have finished, completed, completely uh, processed all of the hydrogen in the core, converted it into helium. Uh, other dying stars. Uh, the mass of these stars is a little bit less than the mass of our sun, and it's the mass that determines the lifetime of a star. Our sun, at one solar mass, has a lifetime of 10 billion years. The lower the mass is, the longer the lifetime. So these stars, at less than the solar mass, have to be more than 10 billion years old. And as I said before, we think they're somewhere around 13. Uh, the variables are variable in their luminosity because they are literally pulsating. These stars are getting bigger, getting smaller, getting bigger, getting smaller, in a periodic manner, with a very, very constant, steady period. Uh, these periods <coughs> range from about two, two tenths of a day to about a little over one day. Uh, their surface temperatures are a little bit hotter than our sun. Our sun has a surface temperature of 5,800 degrees. Their size bigger than our sun. And since it's the temperature and the size of the star that determines how much energy it puts out per, sec per second, these stars are, are very luminous <coughs> relative to our sun. So these are very bright stars, 100 times brighter than our sun. As these stars pulsate, there are two, actually there are more, but there are two uh, more common modes in which they pulsate. Uh, imagine a guitar string. If you had a guitar string, it was fixed on these two ends. 
and you pulled it, took it in the middle and pulled it down and let it go. That guitar string would do something like this. Those of you that have a little bit of physics would know that would be called the fundamental mode of pulsation. But if you took that same guitar string and you went about a quarter of the way out from one end and a quarter of the way out from the other, pull one down and one up and let it go, that guitar string would pulsate like this. And that's the first overtone. These radially pulsating stars pulsate in both the first overtone and in the fundamental mode. This is what the light curve looks like. That is, the star dims, then rises in brightness suddenly, then drops off in brightness more slowly, then repeats this with a period. In the case of the fundamental mode pulsators, that period is usually greater than four tenths of a day. Now, again, we're talking about radial pulsation, so this up and down or this like this is not what we're talking about. In the fundamental mode, the layer that's pulsating increases, decreases, decreases, decreases. However, in the first overtone mode, the pulsation is like this. The pulsating layer, part of it is expanding and part of it is contracting. So these are uh, called first overtone pulsators. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been important in my research is the study of a few, very few, of these variable stars that actually pulsate in both modes simultaneously. Uh, they're called double mode pulsators, or RRD stars. Okay, here is what's called a color magnitude diagram. It's a plot of the color. Uh, this axis here is color. This side is red. This side is blue. It's actually the difference in brightness through a blue filter and a visual filter, which is determined by the temperature. This is the brightness <coughs> scale, although it looks backwards. Uh, it's not. Uh, stars on the main sequence are converting hydrogen to helium in their core, like our sun is right now. But when the hydrogen in the core is depleted, the <coughs> star will begin to increase in luminosity, that is, in its energy output from the core, and this increase in luminosity will push the outer layers of the star out, causing them to expand and cool. So on the color magnitude diagram, it will go up in luminosity and towards the red end until it reaches the tip of this diagram, which is called the red giant region. About four billion years from now, our sun is going to become a red giant. And it's in that phase, when it's up here, that the helium core suddenly ignites and it jumps down to the horizontal branch. Now, depending exactly on its mass, it will either be here, the red horizontal branch, or there, the blue horizontal branch. But if its temperature, i.e., mass also, falls into a certain specific range, that will cause this valve mechanism in the star to, to alternately trap and release the light. When it traps the light, that light pressure pushes the star out. As the star expands and cools, the light is no longer trapped. It's released, so it collapses on itself to start the process all over again. That's what makes these variable stars variable. 